Hey, how's it going guys? It's your boy Meteor Kaiser back again with part two of the Can You Beat Fire Emblem 10 Radiant Dawn without bonus experience or skills. And I guess kind of in this part, I do no supports as well. The the supports is like artificial in an artificial increase in difficulty for me. I just never end up remembering to do supports. And I thought, oh, let's just completely scratch supports from now on and just go through it without those. So make it a little bit more difficult for us. So in the last part, we got through chapters, or I guess we got through part one and two of the game, which is the Dawn Brigade and then the Crimean Royal Knights. And on this part, we are going to be jumping into something we're a bit more familiar with, especially our main character, Ike, we're going to be jumping back into the Grail Mercenaries, who have been hired as a mercenary group for the Laguz Alliance between the war between the Laguz and Benyon. The, so the Benyon forces are split up into the Apostles, so Sonaki from the first game, and then the Senators, which are like a bunch of different nobles who are really bad people. Let's just so there's not really any good people there. So the Grail mercenaries get hired on behalf of the Laguz Alliance. So they are assisting in the fight against Benyon. So the game opens up, or I guess the part opens up with the prologue, the Great Advance. Very interesting part in which you're basically split up in between two groups. The Grail mercenaries who you control, and then a bunch of Laguz controlled by Skrimir, who is the nephew of the King of Gallia. And I will never be able to pronounce his name. It's like Cain, I guess, or something. But anyway, Skrimir is the next in line to become the king of Gallia. Because I think Cain, does not have children. So he's basically using this as an opportunity to get more experience on the battlefield. He's a very strong guy. But he's just a little bit naive. But anyway, let, let's just jump into a bit of our Grail Mercenaries, will we? So the Grail Mercenaries in this game are the strongest group by far. Like, that's pretty much indisputable. If you think the Dawn Brigade is better than the Grail Mercenaries, you're, you're definitely messed up. In the head somehow but let's just start top down all right ike is no surprise ike is super powerful not as great early on as you'd think because he doesn't have ragnell he has a weapon called the atard which is pretty useful and only he can wield it and it's got 50 uses so it's pretty nice he's strong but i wouldn't say he's the best grail mercenary we also have oscar boyd and Rolf, the three brothers. Rolf is about the same as he was in the first game. He's not awful. I think he's a level one sniper. So all, every single one of the girl mercenaries are at their second tier. Some are obviously higher level than others. Those being like Shinon and Titania. Even Oscar's up there a bit. But Rolf, not really that worth investing into. You only really need one archer. And you're probably going to want to pick Shinon over Rolf any day of the week. But if you want to do the whole zero to hero type thing, it's a cool idea to raise him. Mia is a fantastic swordswoman. She's really, really good at dodging things. You put her on the grass tile, she's pretty much good. Boyd is a good warrior, but very slips off in the later game. Same thing with Oscar. He's very strong, but he slips off compared to Titania. Titania has just going to be straight up all, boy, all powerful throughout the entire game. Very good and solid unit. Shina is probably one of the best units as well. Very, very strong sniper, which is surprising considering archers are not typically that good in Fire Emblem games. Gaytree, the little knight guy, is also really good. The only thing to be careful about with him is mages do a shit ton of damage to him, but just leave him out of enemy range of mages and you're fine. You've got Reese and Mist as healers. Reese is better than Mist as a healer, I, I believe, but it's probably better to raise Mist just for plot related purposes later on. And also she becomes a Valkyrie, which is pretty nice. And also when she promotes to her third tier, she gets a mount, which is pretty nice. But overall, the only real, I guess, weak member would be Rolf. So I don't really use him that much, but everyone else I use a lot. Oh, and of course, how, how could I forget Soren? I always forget Soren. I don't know why. Soren, very strong mage, very fragile though. So again, keep him out of enemy range and you're pretty good. Though he's honestly probably one of the weaker members, which is kind of funny to say, but I don't know. Soren just seems to slip off in this game compared to Path of Radiance. But anyway, with the sort of Dawn Brigade members out of the way, this chapter is in the dark so you're going to be going through it completely blind but i just recommend putting either getry or ike forward first and then you can use ranged units to attack the enemies and then come in with someone like mia as the final attacker for the turn that's usually what i did and all you got to do is basically get to the end point and help out skrimir clear out the chapter the combination of skrimir and a few of the girl mercenaries who beat the boss silvano move on to the first chapter laguz and bjork 
And guys, if you haven't done so already, go ahead and hit that subscribe button. It means a lot to me. It would help out a lot. You can always unsubscribe later. Appreciate it. All right, this first chapter actually gave me more problems than I thought it was going to. This is surprisingly pretty fucking difficult. I have no idea why it ended up being so difficult, but... So in this chapter, you get a couple of green units. You get Leth and Liar, who Leth we have used in part two, and Liar is another cat lagoose. Not very good units at all. They are really bad. The good thing is, if they are defeated in the chapter, they will be able to use it later on, so you don't have to worry about that as much. The biggest problem about this chapter is just there's enemies that come from three sides. There's reinforcements in the bottom left, where you spawn, there's enemies that come around the right side, and then there's a small little narrow path where enemies come on the left side. Now my strategy for that was to just leave Mia and Xion over there, just to help defend against the enemies, because I know that they could take attacks in the grassy area. Mia's got insanely good dodge, so I wasn't too worried about that. And then with my, the rest of my units, I would push them towards the right side. I'd leave Ike back to deal with reinforcements, but everyone else would be going towards the right side, talking to the villagers, getting the items in said village. The items that we can get from the chapter in general are from the two villages are a blue gem and a seraph robe. Very useful to get. There's a couple of hidden treasures, including a torch and two coins. If you want to go for those, sure, go ahead. <laughs> it's on the wiki. <laughs> <laughs> and then just dealing with the rest of these units, we finally make our way up to the boss Ramit and move on to chapter 3-2, Storm Clouds. This, this entire part is really long, so that's why this is going to be just one video by itself. Kind of a lot. So Storm Clouds is a very interesting chapter. It's interesting because of just how damn big it is. Also in this chapter, we get access to a few of our older units. We get Brom, Nefane back, Heather, Ileana, and Har. Oh man, seeing Har and Nefane is amazing. It's not bad to have Brom back and then Heather and Ileana are just like, okay, whatever. I don't really care about either of those two, to be honest. So this map is sort of split into two. There's a south path and a north path. I use some of my bulkiest units to deal with the enemies in the south. And then I sort of push the rest of my forces through into the middle. Because once you clear up the enemies in the south, you have to go through a swampy territory and that's honestly not worth it. So I'll just clear out those enemies and then move them all up. Besides from a few like Gaytree, because I want Gaytree to deal with those southern enemies. I'll try and use party members that have a bit more range on their movement. Or like Titania, Har, those kinds of characters. There's a few reinforcements in the northwest, so just be careful. And remember, you have a lot of frail units right now. So I do recommend just checking enemy like selecting an enemy and seeing how far it can move. I do get pretty lucky with this chapter. Like I leave Shinon out in the open more often than I should have, but he ended up being fine. There is an enemy with a bolting tome, which hit Ike and dropped him down super low. So I was like, oh fuck, is he gonna get killed? And then he basically left with four HP and I was, I barely lived. I was like, <gasps> Ooh, dodged a bullet there, holy shit. But after that, the rest of the chapter was relatively easy. There's more reinforcements from the northeast. So just take things slowly, get some of your other units some nice XP, and you'll be able to beat the boss Estefan without many problems. Next, we move on to 3-3, River Crossing. River Crossing is where we have a very infamous line. Interesting maneuver. But the, basically, the concept of this chapter is we have to sneak into a Benyon base and burn a bunch of supplies. So it's not too bad. Har is my main guy for this. There's also a couple of other strategies you can use. There are a bunch of horses that have been locked up. If you break their cages, you can let them free and it helps to just distract the enemies a bit. It creates a bit more chaos among the map. It's not that big of a deal, but it's nice. But yeah, Har is very useful on this map. Uh, I would just be careful. There are a lot of generals around and they are very powerful also be careful of the bit of ships another thing that you won't want to do is when you sort of clear out an area some senators will pop out of said tents and you're going to want to take them down because most of them are holding pretty good items those items are two of the senators have an Eshera icon and a white gem the white gem sells for 10k and an Eshera icon increases luck so pretty useful there's some tents with a blossom skill a Hamern staff and a master crown now master crowns are what's used to get a unit into tier three and again i i stated this in the first episode but you can also level your character up to 21 in the US release to get them to tier 3. So characters like Titania who are super close to tier 3, I will just level up the old fashioned way. But some of them that are a little bit further along, 
I will use a master crown because we have enough of them to go around like four, five, six ish throughout the game. So not too bad. I'll be doing a lot of poking with enemies with Nephany with a javelin as much as I can. I also have been forging some weapons. I forged the five points, the infamous five points. If you get that reference, good on you. But Shinon got that and the odd weapon here and there. I don't want to spend too much of my money because money isn't the easiest thing to come across in this game. Anyway, we clear through all of the tents. I wipe up a lot of the enemies with the help of Har and Titania, Ike and Boyd, who are doing the majority of the work in this chapter and then i'm able to knock my way all the way up to veona and beat the chapter we move on to three four the general's hand ah the general's hand is one of those climby climby chapters we basically have to make our way from the bottom of a hill to the top of a hill we have some nice and useful Lagoo's allies, just green units, and we basically have to get to the end of the chapter with both Ike and Renolf, who joins in this chapter, along with Kiza, another Lagoo's, who I do not use at all, and then Liar, who's another Lagoo's I don't use. I don't use very many Lagoo's in this game, but I'm more pain in the ass than they are worth, for some of them at least. Anyway, the biggest thing to worry about in this chapter, there's a lot of Ballistas, so be careful of Soren and Mist and Reese. Because they're going to be the ones that are getting attacked the most. I send Boyd and Shinon up to the middle path to climb up. And then I send everyone else around the side. Hara is trying to deal with those ballistas as fast as humanly possible. While also not getting murdered instantly. So it's a lot of playing can mouse and just hoping and praying that you don't get fucked too hard. But anyway, we're able to defeat the boss Callum. Move on to chapter 3-5, Retreat. Alright, in this chapter, it's a defense chapter, which is pretty nice. We get access to Rayson, who's one of the Herons. The last of the ones that we've seen, right? Because we've done Raphael, Leanne, and now Rayson. Rayson's probably the best one, because when he transforms, he's able to sing for four people at once. And he's just a little tiny bit bulkier than the others. Just barely. But yeah, anyway, so this is a defense chapter. There are a lot of knights and a lot of paladins. The good thing is, not very many of them have two range. So my general strategy for this, oh, the middle was awful, right? So I basically put someone at every single ledge to prevent anyone from climbing up said ledge. And so basically in the middle, I'd use Mia and Gatry to block it off. Mia is strong and she's very good at dodging, but if she does get hit, she's very frail. So it's like one or two of those and she's donezo. So that's why I kept my healers around her. Then on the left side of the map, I had Oscar, Shinon, Soren, Ike, and Nephany. One for each ledge. And then on the right, I had I had Brom, Har, and Boyd. I keep racing on the left side in case anyone needed to be moved. And then I'd keep Reese sort of floating so he could heal whoever needed to. The scariest part was probably the right side because Boyd got hit a lot. And Boyd isn't as tanky as Har is. Boyd is kind of like decent and same with brom they're both decent but they can't like they can't take like 40 hits like har can and of course there's two there's two areas that you have to block off so it's like i can't just leave har there and hope and pray like i did at the defense chapter in the last episode the last part and we don't have access to any of the other lagoos like leth mordecai mordecai liar kaizan ranulf so it, it's fun but it isn't too bad i okay, guess the defense chapter so me defeating the boss lombroso not gonna happen i'm not going out there hell no but after about 10 turns we're good we move on to a reason to fight which is very interesting because this is the last for a chapter or so of the regular grail mercenary fights and we're actually jumping back into a dom brigade chapter and oh my god does this chapter fucking suck i hate this chapter with a burning passion it's so difficult remember your dom brigade characters are the same strength they were before they're not promoted so literally i have jill who's decent zeke who's decent soth who's decent and nolan who's decent and then micaiah who's okay everyone else like leonardo edward volu even voluk fiona Lara, Arn, all of those guys suck. So it's, this this chapter you can go one of two ways. And I did it the stupid way at first. I tried to, you basically, you have to defeat a certain amount of enemies. Depending on the mode that you're playing on my mode, I, pl I believe I have to defeat 46 and enemies so literally the best strategy and i should have realized this is just hide back hold back in the front area do not even bother going out into the middle i just left south at the top with micaiah i left zeke hark on the right with nolan and then basically i had jill float around because she has mobility and i'd use volug a little bit at least the one good thing about this chapter is the 
Lagoos have like zero mobility. And the reason we're fighting against the Lagoos is because Micaiah is the general of the Dane army now. And we're fighting for Benyon because the King Peleus told us to. And we'll figure out why that happens later, but long story short, we're sort of forced into a war we don't want to be a part of. So it takes me several tries to try and clear this, but I'm eventually able to wait it out. Essentially, I kill enough Lagoos and I'm able to move on to Rivals Collide. Now, if you wanted to defeat the boss in this chapter, it'd be fine. It would be either Leth or if Leth is gone, it would be someone named Kezda. But even if you defeat them, they should still stay back. They should still be able to regroup for the future. So don't worry about if you want to defeat them. But we move on to 3-6 Rivals Collide. And at this stage, we're not even halfway done with this chapter or this part. It's so bad. Rivals Collide is back on the Grail Mercenary side of things, and you're basically in the same map. You're just taking the opposite side. And the last map had Fog of War. This one doesn't. You also have access to two very good Lagoos, Janoff and Olki, who are really good Hawk Lagoos. They have nice mobility. They're pretty strong by themselves. They're no horror, but they're still pretty good. This is kind of a weird concept, but what you can basically do is you can steal units from the Dawn Brigade, and bring them over to the Grail Mercenaries. And that's what I did in this chapter. You can steal two units. You can steal Jill, and you can steal Zekarg. I don't steal Zekarg because I don't have the units to do so in my party. So you need some of the Lagoos, and I just didn't bring them. You can steal Jill with Har. And I want to steal Jill because I want her to get a bit more experience. And I don't plan on using Zekarg in the long term anyway, so. But I do plan on using Jill in the long term. because She's a very good unit. So basically my strat for that was I bring Janoff, Olki, and Hara over to the left side where Jill is kind of hiding out at. And I bring just out of range of getting hit by Jill, but just in range that I can talk to her within a turn. Talk, retreat. And even if you defeat and like enemy members of the Dumb Brigade in this chapter, they're still going to survive. So don't worry too much about that. But all you basically have to do to win this is just survive. If you survive 12 turns, you'll be fine. So basically I send the rest of my army down the middle and it kind of sucks because Oscar and Titania cannot progress a certain amount because they cannot go through the mud. So you have to leave them at certain spots. So basically when we're at that point, I'm just like, all right, let's just attack whatever comes to us. Good thing is mobility sucks for everyone. So I play it safe. I use concoctions when I need to. I do fail a couple of times, but that's because of poor placement of my units basically. So it's not too bad of a chapter. It's not as bad as the previous one though. We move on to the next chapter, 3-7 Incandescent Glow. I know obviously this game came out first, but it still gives me really similar vibes of that one map in Fire Emblem Three Houses, the volcano one in part two. It looks exactly the same. There's like volcanic spots that you want to avoid as best as you can, because they will deal 10 damage to each of your units. There's a lot of just annoying units here. And I forgot to mention, but in this chapter, you are playing Grail Mercenaries. I have a very divide and conquer strategy, where basically I send like Shinon, Boyd, and Gatria up to the top, Everyone else down bottom, Har floats as usual. Uh, Shinon is, it's, Shinon is such a weird character. Shinon almost acts like a tank for me in this game. Shinon doesn't have one range until much later on when he gets a bow that gives him one range. However, he's just so damn good and so damn tanky and dodges a lot that I don't even have to worry. I have Risa as a backup healer and Nephany comes along for the ride, but everyone else just pops down to the south part. There's two routes in the south area, so I send Ike down the left one and it's pretty much everyone else down the middle one because Ike can pretty much do everything himself. We slowly encourage our way onto the boss Septimus, defeat him and move on to chapter 3-8 Marauders. All right, well, this is actually 3-9, so I might have messed up which ones I said, but it'll be correct on screen. So the last one was 3-8. Rivals Collide was 3-7. Reason to Fight was 3-6. Okay, so if I said them wrong, I'm sorry. But this one I kind of fucked up on. Okay, so you're going to see that I accidentally, in my recording software, put the wrong damn screen. I had this screen for Path of Radiance that I used, like, a year ago when I made that like five Path of Radiance videos and then I scrapped the series because I didn't really want to do it that way but I accidentally selected that screen so everything is going to look very weird and I apologize for that but it is a pretty quick chapter at least which is the good thing this chapter is our singular Crimean Royal Knights one which basically we have access to Jeffrey, Khalil, Marcia, Danved, Kieran, Astrid, and Makalov. I get them a few items and it's basically a town chapter in which we have to defeat a boss named Roark who isn't too bad but we'll get to him eventually. So we also have some Crimean Knights as 
green units just to help out with dealing with some of the enemies. Again, Maklov and Astrid suck here, and even Marcia sucks, so you're going to be doing a lot of work with Jeffrey. Jeffrey and Kieran are going to be doing the bulk of the work here. Denvid will try and do his best, and same with Khalil. But you're going to be wanting to using those healing grasses a lot and using potions and stuff whenever you can. Be wary of enemy reinforcements to the south from where you spawned, and make your way slowly throughout the chapter, being even more careful of more enemy reinforcements from the right side as well. Long story short is I take on the boss Roark with just Jeffrey and Kieran. Everyone else is just there. The Basically what you want gotta do for this chapter is the Benyon forces are lighting the villages on fire. And what you want to do is put out those flames as quickly as you can just by going up to it and saying extinguish. Or else the buildings are going to burn down. So you could either do that or you could just bum rush the boss, which is what I end up doing, which is honestly a better option. Anyway, we move past that and I realize the errors of my mistake and the next part is a lot better. In the heart of Crimea, we have a very interesting chapter. We're going back over to the Grail Mercenaries. However, everyone from the Crimean Royal Knights and plus a few other, you know, regular green units are all in this chapter as green units. So being green units, they are very stupid. So what I have to end up doing is sending a few of my units like Mia, Oscar, Ike, and Naphne up north just to give them a bit of support so they don't end up suiciding into the enemies. Then I send the rest of my guys down south to clear up the knights and paladins down there, or the generals and paladins down there. Rayson almost gets completely murdered, but I'm able to avoid that barely by bringing him back, just playing more of a passive role. And this is where I start using Mist more than Reese. Because I'm like, oh, maybe Mist is going to be a bit more useful to me in the long run. Also, by this point, I have my first tier 3 unit, which is Titania, who is a gold knight now. She didn't really... She got a couple of skills. And here's the thing, right? I said no skills. But I didn't... I said I would not be adding any skills. So it's kind of clickbait, I guess. But whatever skill she already has, I'm leaving. I'm not touching their skills. I'm not adding. I'm not getting rid of. But yeah, just like... This is, again, a super long chapter. So like any long chapters in any Fire Emblem games, you just want to take it slow. I obviously want to be able to keep up with the green units and assist them as best as I can. And of course, I want to kill the enemies that the green units are attacking because that's empty experience. I might as well be giving that to someone else. Thankfully, the good thing is, is they will attack a lot of the green units before they will attack your blue units. So just be careful though, because Makalov almost died. And I don't know if, if the Crimean Royal die here. I don't know if they die for permanent. So don't quote me on that. But anyway, we make our way to the end, to the boss Sergei, defeat him, and move on to 311, Just Cause. Ah, oh, Just Cause. That is a reminiscent chapter. Not as bad as in the last game, but oh my god, is it still kind of, a, kind of annoying. Just Cause is the beginning of basically when the Benyon forces get split in two. Because Sanaki basically comes out of her hiding and announces to everyone that, hey, these are basically traitors. And so Benyon splits their forces in two between the Senators and the Apostles' forces. And the Apostles' forces join us. So we get access to a few more units, which are Sigrun and Tanith, who are the basically the Royal Knights of Sanaki herself. Now between these two, Sigrun is better than Tanith, because higher leveled and just a little bit better bases. Tanith is still pretty good though. Ultimately, neither of them are that great. Sigrun's pretty nice, and she's very close to tier 3 which I will end up tier 3 her, and then Tanith would take a lot longer. That's the only problem. But anyway, this is that bridge chapter from the original game, in which there's going to be pitfalls. Enemies are starting to use light runes, which basically will block off a path for, for, from you, so you can't go that way. Everyone has to funnel into one hole, and... God, this chapter, I hate this chapter, because I have to reset a lot. Well, also, it's mainly because of my stupidity. I end up doing this a lot with Nephany. I'm trying so hard to get Nephany to be strong, but man, she just isn't as good as I thought she was going to be. She's way too frail. I mean, it would have helped if I had BXP to use on her. However, kind of can't do that, so maybe hindsight's 2020. but still, I'm a simp, so I gotta keep simping for my girl, you know? My best, honestly, again, my best unit in this entire chapter isn't even Ike. Isn't even Gatry. It's Shinon again. I don't understand why that man is so damn bulky. Why I don't get why he's bulk. He seems bulkier to me than freaking Gatry, which makes no sense to me, but I'm just like, all right, let's just rock it. We also get access to a little helper in this chapter. We get to Barn, 
which is really nice. The only thing with that is, and I mean, it's up to you guys if you want to use Tabarn and his units more, but I don't. I have them start at the beginning of the chapter because I want this experience, especially for Jill. Now, that probably made the chapter harder for me, but whatever. Shinon's tier 3 now, and the cool, the best thing about Shinon being tier 3 is he gets an extra range. So that means he is, instead of being 2 range bow user, he is 2 to 3 range bow user, which is just insane to me. It's so cool. But if you can try and figure out what the pitfalls are, that's useful. But if you can't figure out what the pitfalls are, just hope and pray that a good unit gets trapped in them. If not, block them off make sure you're healing as much as you can and you should be able to make your way over to goron pretty easily as long as you're careful don't do anything stupid use to barn if you need to and that's about it next up we move on to the price which is another dawn brigade chapter in which we get a little bit more of a backstory on why peleus is doing what he's doing it's kind of because he was forced into a blood contract with izuka and if he doesn't obey what the senate does dane's countrymen will die so he's kind of stuck between a rock and a hard place so this chapter is very oh very a lot more difficult than i thought all right so the concept of this chapter is you have to defeat a certain amount of enemies there is a shit ton of very scary enemies at the bottom of that cliff and so basically my best strategy for this was keep all of my weak units out of harm's reach so no Edward, no Leonardo, no Arn, no Laura, no Fiona. On the left side, I would use Torneo to help block some of the enemies that are coming up top, like the Pegasus Knights and stuff like that. And on the right side, I would use anyone else who's strong enough to sort of hold their own. So even Makai is stronger, strong enough to hold her own. So I'd use Volug, Nolan, Soth. Zekark and Micaiah. And thankfully you have a lot of green units that'll help you out. So you basically just gotta play the slow game again. Don't rush into it too much. Use your green units as much as you can. Don't try and get too much experience because it just is not worth it. These enemies are way too powerful for you to be dealing with properly and you're only able to pick them off if you really work as a group. Don't even think about defeating Sigrun because that just will not happen. If you can do it, by all means, but that's a psychopath's mood. After that, we move on to the second last chapter, Blood Contract. Blood Contract's kind of dark because we're basically forced to kill Peleus. Either Micaiah can kill Peleus or Torneo can kill Peleus. Now if you're playing this game your second time onwards on this file, you're able to save Peleus' life and he'll become a unit later on. However, since this is the first playthrough on this save file, I kind of don't have a choice. So I, it's either you can have Torneo kill him or you can have Micaiah kill him. And I just had Micaiah do it because I thought it'd be funnier. So goodbye, King. So basically this is another defense chapter, but this is a little bit different of a defense chapter. And usually it's uh, if an enemy reaches one spot, game over. This is if an enemy reaches an entire line across. You, they cannot pass the defense line. Good thing is, is there's a lot of ledges. So if you just put a few of your units at those ledges, they should be able to block most of the enemies. So I basically have my weaker, my weaker units hiding in the top, defending the defense line, making sure nothing pops through. Makai has a purge tome, which she's able to use to pick off a few of the weaker Lagoos. There's also a few ballistas, which are pretty useful. I guess they're rock throwers. So my units are kind of spread out like this. I leave Soth on the left side with a few of the weaker units. And Soth is pretty much able to take care of most of everything by himself. The good thing is the boss for this chapter, Ike, will not move from his spot. I put units like Volug and Torneo on the right side. And then I hope and pray that the green units live. And if not, I have Nolan, Micaiah, and Zekark just chilling, preventing anyone from climbing up. So, to be honest, it's a good idea if you use Laura with a Physic to heal up some of the green units, especially those two knights hanging out in the center, because they'll live for a while, which will be very, very useful. I do almost die a couple of times, Soth almost bites the dust, which is scary. Towards the end of the chapter, the rest of the Grail mercenaries will come in, and you can actually defeat Ike if you want to, but... You have to get through Ike and Soren, which is kind of scary. So I just don't think it's a, a decision that's, that makes any sense. So with enough patience and willpower, I'm able to keep healing up the friendly units, using Torneo and Soth as sort of the blockers to prevent any units from getting in either side. Pretty nice. A lot of the units go after Torneo more. Don't know why, but I'm fine with that. And the good thing is, if there is a Lagoos at the bottom of a cliff, they literally cannot do anything because they do not have any ranged attacks. That is the best thing about this chapter is there's no enemies with any ranged attacks. So as long as you have an, a unit at a cliff, they cannot climb said cliff. 
so you're chill. I even use Leonardo to poke down at the enemies from above, even though he's weak as shit, but he's still not bad, because at this point, Leonardo, Nolan, and Edward have unique swords and weapons to them. Those are pretty useful. They're not terribly strong weapons, but they're really good for the unit that they are that they're for leonardo's bow in particular is pretty good and it can be used by anyone else now one thing i haven't mentioned is actually edward kind of dies in this chapter it was an l i was willing to take and there's no way i'm resetting for edward so rest in peace buddy in hindsight i should have just given back all of his items to another unit but i didn't think about that so oops oh well not that big of a deal i don't think nothing lost nothing gained we survive through our 12 turns and we're able to make our way to from pain awakening the end game of part three and holy shit this is 14 chapters long now for being an end game chapter this is so goddamn easy you start out as the grail mercenaries you have your allies which literally is to barn scrimmier so to barn at the bottom and scrimmier at the top and all you have to do is technically you're supposed to route all of the enemies but when you defeat about 80 enemies the chapter will end and to be honest a lot of the enemies are not that difficult i will send most of my units into the middle and i'll spread a few of my more mobile units up to the north to help out Skrimir and down to the south to help out Tabarn. But for the most part, most of my units are going into the middle and they're just slowly going to be defeating a lot of these enemies. Be careful, there are a couple of red dragons around, which are very, very scary lagoos. So either avoid them or gang up on them. Either or kind of works. But I honestly was kind of scared towards the end because I left Har and Titania by themselves. I thought they were just going to surround and destroy them both. But to be honest, most of the units didn't even attack. So I was like... This is weird, but also okay. And I would not go too deep into the chapter, just wait for the enemy reinforcements to come to you. Because if you do, you'll still being attacked by, like, Micaiah, who leaves about 30 kills, so that's not that bad. But you don't want to be attacked by, like, Nyla, for example. You get attacked by Nyla, you're fucked. The only one I can defend against her is probably Har or Titania. But basically, Har and Titania are doing most of my heavy lifting this chapter. Har is also tier 3 at this point, which is great. Very strong. Ike will be poking around, same with Shinon and a few of my other units, but to be honest, characters like Boyd have fallen off a bit, and I pretty much know what my endgame team is going to be like at this point already. I will get more into that next chapter, because that's going to be very, very important to know how everything works for part 4. As I said, once you get to 80 kills, the chapter is over, you just got to keep destroying enemies, and the kills that your green units get count as well. So to be honest, you could literally just let Tabarn do everything and you're fine. Tabarn will literally not die, so because nothing can t nothing can scratch him. It's, it's amazing. The last chapter, Blood Contract, was a lot harder than From Pain Awakening. And anyway, that is the end of part three slash part two. Because it's part two for us, but part three for the game. This was probably the funnest of the entire game, like the funnest part, because I love the Grail Mercenaries. A lot of the units are so fun to use. Titania's fun, Har is fun, Mia's fun, even Ike's fun. Even though I'm kind of sick of Ike. Very very good units, and it's just a lot less painful than the Dombri even though we had a few Dumb Brigade chapters. The worst thing about it is the fact that it was 14 goddamn chapters in one part. But anyway, guys, thank you so much for watching. Make sure to check out my other stuff if you are interested. Some of that will be linked down in the description below. We will be doing a part four slash part three later on. Again, why did I make that confusing? But anyway, guys, thank you so much for watching. My name has been Media Kaiser, and I'll see you in the next one. But until then, as always, peace.